tales for dark nights. of the mind. Welcome to the Simply Scary Podcast, Season 1, Episode 15. I'm your Master of Ceremonies, G.M. Danielson. out the most interesting characters, doesn't it? For example, imagine that you're taking a walk in the woods on a cool, moonlit evening, when you happen to stumble upon a stranger there amongst the trees' creaking limbs. He seems harmless enough, a lonesome fellow traveller, but his ensuing request to take a walk with him opens up a world far more disturbing than you could ever imagine. The pair of stories for this episode have been masterfully performed by Otis Jiry, our resident master storyteller, in order to provide you a window into a new world which he is about to introduce. This Saturday, December 17th, we invite you to join Mr. Jiry along his very own trail of terror as he unveils his own horror storytelling program, Walking in the Dark, which will be available weekly on simplyscarypodcast.com as well as on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel and, of course, on iTunes and wherever else podcasts are available. So without delay, denizens of the dark, let us leave our comfort zones, grab our nearest flashlight, and venture into one man's forest of fear. Allow Mr. Jiry to guide us down the darkened path, as together we go walking in the dark. Our first frightful chapter puts us in the midst of a disturbing experiment where a researcher has possibly done the unthinkable, capturing and monitoring a human soul. But as his test subject surpasses the expected life of his initial experiment, his mind struggles to unravel the impossible truth. That he has made a terrible mistake in his choice of guinea pig. Otis Jiry performs James Colton's Windows to the Soul. For a long time, debate raged over whether or not there existed such a thing as a soul. Science nearly discredited the entire idea, but then came the breakthrough. The soul became an accepted fact of human existence, as widely believed in as the existence of the stomach. Of course, there's a big difference between knowing and understanding. In the case of souls, current technology is incapable of studying them without killing the subject. After death, the soul vanishes, so we know they exist, but we know nothing about them. Until now. I've developed a containment device that I am certain can hold the soul in place long enough for me to make a few observations. As for the subject, I've procured a death row inmate. 
His involvement in my experiment postponed the end of his life by several weeks, so he was happy to participate. The test begins in an hour. I expect it to last another hour at most. I shall report my findings when it's complete. I can't believe what I've accomplished. I can't believe the experiment is still ongoing. My containment device worked better than I ever thought possible. Souls have always vanished at the moment of, or moments after, death. My device is based on readings taken during those times, and it attempts to block whatever forces causes the disappearance. It was only supposed to maintain the status quo of the immediate moment of death for a short time. Long enough, I hoped, for some new discoveries, but never this long. It has been five hours since the experiment started, and the soul of Bruce Merrick is still contained. I only left the testing chamber because I can't stay awake any longer, and I needed to make this record while it was all still fresh in my mind. Here's what happened. First, I rendered the subject unconscious to ensure a painless death. The actual method of execution I chose was decapitation for its swiftness and certainty. Bruce was restrained within the containment device and decapitated via a remote-controlled guillotine. The containment device was activated just prior to the guillotine. Souls are, of course, invisible, but my instruments were able to detect its presence immediately. It occurred to me as I wrote this that my instruments could be faulty. Before I go any further, I should run a diagnostic. The diagnostic is complete. My instruments are operating flawlessly. Bruce Merrick, or at least his soul, is still contained within the chamber. Furthermore, I've observed a strange phenomenon. The containment area is filled with a very thin mist. I almost overlooked it as I ran the diagnostic, but it's there. I wonder if it's an effect of the containment field on the soul or if this is how a soul behaves when trapped in one place for an extended period of time. It's late, so I'll sleep on it. In the meantime, I've set up every recording device I have to monitor the testing chamber. I rushed to the testing chamber first thing this morning, and my findings are fascinating. The mist is still present, thicker than last night, but also clinging more to the floor rather than filling the entire space. The floor also appears damp. Bruce's body still lies in its restraints, his head staring at me from the tub it landed in. I really want to remove his corpse, but there's no way to do that without disturbing the experiment. Reviewing the video footage from last night, sped up of course, the thickening and sinking of the mist is apparent. There was nothing in the audio aside from the expected background of my machinery. I've spent the morning in observation, and it is now 12.30. I still can't believe how effective my containment device is. The subject has endured for 16 hours now, far beyond my initial estimate. Interestingly, the signals coming from the soul have gotten stronger... This is why I believe the mist and moisture is in fact the soul manifesting itself. I still don't know why it's becoming visible, and I probably won't have an answer until the experiment is concluded. When I left for lunch, the mist had become so thick that the floor was entirely obscured. It is pure white and about four inches deep. After lunch... I noticed that the mist no longer filled the entire floor. The edges of the containment field are bare once more. My instruments are no longer useful because the signals coming off the soul are now too strong for them to register. They simply were never designed for something this clear and powerful. I noticed that the bare floor, which earlier I described as damp, seems perfectly dry. I think I will try to recalibrate some spare equipment to handle the stronger signals coming out of the chamber. It has now been nearly 24 hours since the start of the experiment, and there is a new development. 
the mist has continued to coalesce and shrink. At the center, there is what appears to be a solid mass. It's just a shallow dome of white poking above the rest of the mist. My recalibrated instruments have kept up with the ever-increasing levels, but I may have to make more adjustments tomorrow. The mist was all gone this morning. I was alarmed at first, although the containment field still seemed to be working. All I saw in the chamber was Bruce's corpse. The floor was completely bare, save for a few dark brown flecks of blood that the tub failed to catch. Then I saw, in one corner of the chamber, a small puddle of white liquid. Rising out of it was a lump of white larger than the one I observed last night, but otherwise the same. Now and then, it seemed to throb or shift. At the moment, I'm unsure if this amorphous mass is, in fact, solid. The only way to find out would be to enter the chamber, and I cannot do that for reasons stated earlier. My containment device was never meant to run for this long, and I wonder if such an extended test is taking its toll on the equipment. There seems to be a... well, I can only describe it as a change in the air. I feel it every time I enter the lab. I should check on the machinery again and make sure the containment field isn't about to explode. The machinery is working fine. Perhaps the energized feeling is just my own excitement. I haven't gone into the lab all evening. I just didn't feel like it, I guess. Instead, I reviewed the video footage from the past 24 hours. It's fascinating to watch the mist develop. It first appeared a couple hours after the subject's death. There was no concrete source. It simply faded into existence, filling the entire chamber right from the beginning. Seeing this time-lapse version of events, it is clear that the mist is condensing. It's like watching steam turn to water, then ice. Every time I reach the end of the recording, I pause and stare at the blob. Something about it. As I was writing this, I glanced at the video one more time. I thought I saw an anomaly just before the recording stopped. I, I hesitated to write it down. I only caught it out of the corner of my eye, and it is late. I'll review the footage again in the morning when I'm not so sleep-deprived. The anomaly was nothing. I made myself go to the lab this morning. The blob has grown. It sits in the center of the chamber, about a half meter tall, during the apex of one of its throbs. I can't be certain of this, but there may be a translucent film acting as a skin. I'm afraid that's all I noted before lunch. I was eager to get out of there. I think it's the sight of Bruce's head lying in the tub, and the memory of that anomaly last night, which turned out to be nothing. I didn't go into the lab at all today, I'm not feeling well. I was able to monitor the live video footage from today. The blob has begun moving around the chamber. I think it accomplishes this in a manner similar to a slug. Its progress is very slow. It seems to be moving in the direction of Bruce's body. A thought just, just occurred to me. If this blob is the soul, it is, in fact... I must test this theory immediately. I don't feel well enough to write anything down. Check the audio recording for the results of my experiment. Haven't been back to the lab for two days. Irresponsible of me. Fortunately, I finally returned today to find everything still in working order. I deleted the audio recording from my last experiment. I was out of sorts, not in my right mind. No doubt, I corrupted the results. The evidence was worthless, so I got rid of it. I arrived at the testing chamber to find the blob sitting on top of the subject's head. It hadn't grown much since I last saw it, but its shape was altered slightly. Where before it was mostly a round lump, it now has a contour, vaguely suggesting pseudopods. 
It appeared to use these to prod the subject, especially in the region of the eyes. I received a very disturbing phone call this morning. Thank goodness for computers. I doubt my handwriting would be legible now. The short version is this. Bruce Merrick was innocent. Some new evidence turned up, and while Bruce certainly wasn't a clean, law-abiding citizen, he was not the murderer who he thought he was. He definitely did not belong on death row. I keep telling myself if it's too late. No amount of regret will change that. Had I not pulled Bruce into this experiment, he would have been executed by the state even sooner. The best I can do is carry on with my work so his death won't have been for nothing. I went into the lab tonight, but I wish I hadn't. I'm not sure which is more disturbing, the phone call this morning, or the image that met me in the containment chamber. Bruce's body was gone. His head was still there, but not in the tub. It was placed on the floor close to the glass. The eyes were missing. As for the blob, it was on the far side of the containment field, much larger than it had been before. The thing seems to sense my approach. It turned, or rather twisted, to look at me. As it did, its shapeless form took on shape. No, the suggestion of a shape. Never before had it looked so human. I could now make out a distorted, underdeveloped head, neck, torso. The limbs were as yet amorphous stubs, but it was close enough that I shuddered just recalling it. The energized feeling I mentioned earlier, it had come back with a vengeance when that thing looked at me. I'm convinced now that it isn't radiation off the machines, but something more primal from within. I was afraid. Perhaps before I was overcome with excitement, but today's revelations have quenched my eagerness. Tonight... I was inexplicably afraid. I can't sleep, so I'm recording my thoughts. The one thing that has always held back mankind's study of the soul is that it requires killing the test subject. This didn't bother me because I was experimenting on a man already sentenced to death. But now it turns out I wasn't. If that thing is truly Bruce's soul... Why did I delete that audio recording from the other night? On a whim, I decided to check the video stream coming from the containment chamber in the lab. Probably won't do anything to help me sleep, but... What is it doing? What is it doing? The blob? Soul? Whatever. It's staring right at the camera. I know it's looking because it has eyes now. Not eyes like iris and pupils. Eyes like indentations in its face. Like someone used a golf ball to poke holes in it. I just put in my headphones to see if there was any audio coming through. There is something, but I can't make it out. It's a deep sound, throbbing. I have to stop doing this to myself. If I don't get sleep, all my observations will be unreliable. I've tried to remember the contents of that deleted audio record. Keep in mind this is a highly unreliable record and shouldn't be seriously considered. Are you Bruce Merrick? Are you Bruce Merrick? Note, my instruments recorded a spike in energy coming from the containment field. Are you Bruce Merrick? If you are not Bruce Merrick, say so now. I take your silence to mean that you are indeed Bruce Merrick. Do you know where you are? Do you know what you are? Is that you attempting to speak? I cannot understand you. Bruce, do you know that you are dead? (laughs) 
Please, repeat that. The sounds that seemed to respond to my questions were deep and muted. I believed at the time that I was creating voices out of the ambient hum of machinery. That's why I wrote it off and deleted the recording. After hearing what I did last night, however, I'm not so sure. I feel I should try another questioning session. My visits to the lab have grown so infrequent, it seems like a foreign place to me now. The thing was sitting in the center of the chamber when I arrived. It seems to have stopped growing, instead only refining its shape. Refining, but toward what, I can't tell. It's like its goal is human, but its aim is terrible. The audio record has the full session, but I'll mention a few details here. I began by asking if the thing was Bruce Merrick. What it did in response made my skin crawl. It performed that same twisting motion I've described before. Then its face began pulling apart. Little holes grew into big holes that merged together until there was a limpless mouth speaking to me. The words were completely unintelligible, but there was meaning in those formless syllables. Meaning I can only guess at, but meaning all the same. I ended the session abruptly, when I noticed that the thing was inching closer to the glass that separated us. I don't know what I'm afraid of. The glass is bulletproof, and the thing has exhibited no signs of strength. Except... But that's just conjecture. There is no video record of what happened back then due to an equipment failure. Just conjecture. But what else could have happened to Bruce's body? Another sleepless night, so I'm again watching the live video stream from the lab. As before, the thing is staring at the camera. Its mouth is moving, but I can't pick up any audio. There's something new as well. Inside the mouth, I think I can make out teeth. Not human teeth. These make me think of a deep-sea fish more than anything else. Needles. Bruce's fate troubles me. He was innocent of murder, according to the court. But he wasn't a good man, either. Strange as it sounds, I think I'd feel better if he'd been a model citizen falsely condemned. I feel like he'd be more likely to forgive. There I go, imparting meaning to things that may be nothing. Strange anomaly in the lab today, as I was checking readings, I noticed that the thing in the chamber was always facing me. What makes it so strange is that it wasn't turning to face me. It just always was. Like, like my brain had invented this image of it looking at me and was projecting it in front of me so that no matter where I was, it always appeared from the same perspective. Even if it's just barely visible on the edge of my peripheral vision, it is clear as day, staring at me with its distorted face. I checked the audio recording a second time just to make sure there hadn't been any sound last night. I guess there must have been something wrong with the stream because I was able to find something. The clearest audio recording I've gotten so far. Liar. I think I'm ready to end this experiment. It has played on my nerves too much, and I've already gathered more data than anyone before me. I will shut down the containment field, releasing the soul to wherever it goes after death. I suspect it will simply dissipate in a manner similar to its coalescence, and that'll be the end of it. I shut down the containment field at one this afternoon. At eight, I returned to collect some things and shut down the lab entirely. It was still there. The first thing I did was check to make sure the containment device was indeed deactivated. It was. Next, I ran to the door of the chamber to make sure it was locked. Again, it was. I don't understand. It required so much power to trap a soul after death to prevent it from vanishing into the unknown. Why now does it remain with nothing to hold it in place? 
Could it be such prolonged exposure to the containment field altered it somehow? Or perhaps the field only gave it enough time to grow and strengthen so that it could remain under its own power? It's pacing the chamber now, but its face is always looking at me. The same anomaly mentioned before. What it's doing now? It's trying the door. What should I do? Can I keep it locked in there indefinitely? I certainly can't let it out. It's banging on the glass now. Banging, but not making any sound. I'm glad ghost stories are just that. Stories. Otherwise, I could expect it to just walk through the wall at any moment. He told me I'd live if I helped him. He said I'd be pardoned. I didn't want to die. He lied. Now, I'm dead. He lied. He lied. It seems the result of that experiment was the discovery that innocence can be a relative concept, especially when the so-called objective observers are far more guilty than the one who has suffered the sentence. But when we return from this short break, we will explore the limits of reality as we hear tell of a truly desperate tale whose catalyst may be more spirit than spirit guide. James Colton's Pages of Dust. Buy it today on Amazon.com. Get Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3 of James Colton's Pages of Dust. Mm, it is good to see you have returned for your second session of spine-tingling terror. You must be one of the strong ones. We've been killing off so many of the weak ones lately, but, uh, but no, pardon me, uh, not sure what I was discussing there. Must have been that zombie crypt that Jesse Cornett keeps. Jeez, GM, give the secret away. Now everybody's gonna want one. Uh, but anyway, our next tale takes us back in time to a battlefield bathed in blood. We bear witness to one man's final chance for redemption as he is led to the gallows. Yet his remonstration reveals something other than repentance. A reality far more frightening than the treachery and murder of which he is accused. Otis Gyrie returns to perform Preston Wu's Cold Wind, Cold Earth. With little evidence towards his innocence, he is to be hanged the Monday from next on charges of military treachery and murder. As for the state and whereabouts of Private Oswald Arthur Crane, they are still unknown. General George Crook, 1877 This is the truth, sir. Flecks of gunpowder and soot cling to the grease on my jaw. Someone sounds the bugle, and someone fires. It is not me, but my name is called in the roll. I see the paint on their faces that must look uncannily similar to the turbid strokes of ash on my own cheeks, and I smell sulfur in the aching wind. All right, you come on. Someone calls for me, throws a heavy bag in my hand before he lets loose another volley from the cannons. Might have been Rudolph, but wrestling with my wagering nerves, I managed to drop the sack when I start fumbling with the cork 
that had been wedged almost flush with the bag slip. Silver dust falls from the pouch when it hits the ground. The stopper rolls into a shallow puddle and bobs for a while, like a schooner trying to right itself on a tiny ocean. What held it there? What rule of our good Lord designed such a thing to be? To float. Oswald always said there is no God. Said everything is chemicals, just action and reaction. I'm not so sure if I agree, especially after that night, sir. Hours before, Oswald and I had been sitting in our tent smoking tobacco that he said was from his pa in Kentucky. He says he ain't ever been able to find anything worth stuffing his pipe with out here in Wyoming. I didn't know. Didn't like smoking pipe. It always gets in my eyes, and he'd laugh when they would start to smart. Oswald was a good man, though. He had his gumption about him and a strong jaw that lets him get away with things that most other people couldn't, like his refusal to button the collar of his uniform. Jokesher, he'd say. Can't kill a savage if your shirt's done killed you first. So he's blowing these chunky clouds of smoke in my face while I'm trying to eat breakfast, and he's telling me about the time a snapping turtle bit off his middle finger. He waves around the nub, above the steaming bowl I have in my hands, acting like he's stirring up my oats with it. I call him on his tall tail, like I always do. I say, last week I heard you say it was an opossum. But he just laughs and keeps going for my bowl. Oswald has this laugh, see? The, the kind that rides up in his nose and makes him whistle. It's queer, and you can hear it a mile away. He was always laughing. And the crow don't like him very much, though, and the Shoshone hate him. He stomps around them like General Crook, calling them things like sleeps with ass and others. Despite all that, me and him managed to make friends with this crow that calls himself Snowbird. Has this big braid of down in its hair and a sharp chin that could cut glass. He's sitting with us around our fire, smiling every time Oswald starts giving me trouble. But Snowbird hasn't been himself since we crossed Goose River. He keeps rubbing dirt in his hands and chewing his lip. And every once in a while, he closes his eyes, really serious, and lets out a deep breath. Better eat something else your ribs will rattle right out of you. Oswald says, finally leaving me to finish my meal. Snowbird nods at him. I did once already. Before Rosebud Creek. Oswald doesn't look like he believes him and tucks his Jaeger tighter under his legs. Not any of my business anyway, but them crow are gonna eat up all your bird seed if you don't get to it first. Oswald laughs and hands me his pipe as he scoops up a handful of water from our pot for a drink. Satisfied, he throws himself onto his back with a wipe of his mustache, and Snowbird and I follow after. For a while, we just laid there under the fall clouds, watching the last couple leaves break from the oaks. Wyoming is quiet in fall, especially in the latter months, see? I'd gone to finishing school, but I still liked asking Snowbird stuff about the forest and other things. He was sharper than any teacher I ever knew, and ever since Bighorn, he had taught me and Oswald how to find mushrooms and rhubarb, how to listen to the birds for trouble, and how to turn the woods into a place that wasn't quite so strange. He liked fall, too. Snowbird says fall reminds us to be grateful for what we have before it's lost, and spring reminds us to be hopeful for the things that come back to us. Snowbird's just a kid, but sometimes he comes off with stuff uh, that'll make your head spin. He's a real bright kid. I can hear Snowbird beside me rustling around with a pile of leaves. He holds up one as big as my face and frowns. It's rotten. has pox and black gunk all over it. I'm snug inside my Jaeger now, too. I've got my empty bowl resting on my chest. And I check out Snowbird's little artifact. 
I spin the leaf in between my fingers like a zoetrope that the city kids have. Infection, he says, and I ask him what kind of infection. Uh, don't know. Don't like these woods, old Cheyenne say. Baxby live here. They are spirit with no home. Old Cheyenne say people get lost in these woods, never come back. He brings his hand up to the wooden owl he always has bound around his neck, his zapalia. Right then, Oswald shoots up from his sack, throwing out his hands to hush us down. He takes a big sniff with his nostrils flared up. You smell that? We don't say anything, but he has this look on his face. Something don't smell right. Me and Snowbird quietly try to get a whiff of whatever he's caught on to. Snowbird is on his feet, crouched like a lion. I know that smell. It smells like... like... a hot steaming barrel of... hogwash. And he throws himself into a fit, rolling around and hollering like a banshee. He would have kept going all day if he hadn't rolled over his pipe and nearly burnt up his sack with a minute. Snowbird doesn't laugh, though, and I don't know whose lead to follow. Oswald is checking his bag for holes, wiping away patches of soot and trying to catch his breath before he speaks again. Now, I know a good ghost story when I hear one. The story of the naked widow down by Red River. The Mary Celeste out east. Even old Rudolph has got one about a hunting dog he used to have. And you know what all of them have in common? Snowbird looks away. They're all stories. Now, I don't think a man needs to reason to wear a bird around his neck all day like it's made of gold. But don't go slinging that hot mess around us like it's gospel truth. Snowbird doesn't say anything back. He just gets up, pats some underbrush from the tassels on his pants, and heads toward the camp where the other crow were staying. I watch him strut away, and I was always amazed at how he never made any sound when he moved. I swear that kid could run a mile on tack biscuits without cracking a single one. He was a good kid. I remember looking to the place where he had been lying, and looking at the body-shaped outline he had made in the dried-up leaves. It almost looked like someone was still there, just invisible or something, you know? Like it was made of air. Nothing really happened that day until this Cheyenne showed up. Came on quick, and we weren't ready. Oswald was still asleep, I suppose, when it all happened. But we didn't know until Crook tried to do a head count. When I realize he isn't there, I just start running. Don't even bother grabbing more powder, but my mescot was on my back, beating against my shoulders with every step. It was like another heart beating upon against mine. The cannons are behind me, pounding through the screams and calls for orders, like the Cheyenne's drums when they start killing. I remember the drums and the cannons. I remember the arrows, seeing the savages tear my friends apart with hatchets and tomahawks while they're still in their tents. I remember seeing my tent all shredded laying on the ground. McCarty was all tangled up in the mess of poles and fabric, his glossy boots were sticking out, still laced up tight. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. He was a kind man. I get to the clearing where Oswald had been, and I see three bodies. One on their back, two of them face down. One of the bodies, with their face in the dirt, has a tomahawk sticking out from his scalp. The other has two arrows in his back and is wrapped up in a wool sleeping bag. They look like saplings growing out of a burlap sack. Oswald. I fall to his side. He's breathing, but not much. He's making this sound like he's hissing every time he tries to suck in some air. I'm scared, then. Scared he's going to be gone. Scared there is nothing I can do. My hands start to shake, and I'm debating pulling out the arrows. Snowbird said something about that. You know, if something like this ever happened, but I can't find it in my head. Leave them in? Pull them out? I, I had to do something. I bring my hand around one of the arrows, and I remember how cold it felt. I needed to get it out of him. 
It would freeze him from the inside out, and he would just freeze and die. And no one would remember him. Except me. I can see in my head his body lying there in the clovers, still in his Jaeger, alone. Snow covers his body in the winter, and when spring comes, he's still frozen like ice. The summer thaws him out, but if I do something, if I do anything, I can stop that. A hand reaches out and grabs mine. I trace the fingers back to an arm and to a face. It's the man on his back. It's Snowbird. He's got a nasty gash cut into his collar, and his right hand is hanging limp like a doll's. Don't, he says in his real weak voice that's more of a squeak than anything. It will just make make it worse. Help me up. Snowbird is on his feet now, and he tells me to grab one side of Oswald's bag so we can get him safer somewhere. I start pulling Oswald inch by inch, getting him closer to the woods, but Snowbird isn't taking on much of the weight. He groans every time he tries to heave. He keeps letting go to grab his shoulder. It looks bad, and I can't watch him suffer. So I train my eyes on the body with the tomahawk. It's got all these shimmering beads of dew on its back, and as a slight drizzle comes on, the coils and splashes of paint on the body start to bleed down into the dirt. He's dead. Snowbird must have seen me staring. Hit me in the shoulder first, but he's dead. We manage to get to the woods and down into this ditch that looks like an old tributary to Rosebud Creek. Ivy and thistles are climbing up both banks, and dusty, jagged chunks of green shale litter the ground in the middle. We put Oswald there, and I start scraping dirt out of his mouth and nose. His gums are bleeding pretty bad by then. Looks like he cracked a tooth. From down there, we could still hear the fight going on, with the cannons going off and people yelling and all that. But in our fox den, it felt like the sound just flew over us. Grandmother Nature has given us a moment of sanctuary to help Oswald. Snowbird said, or something like that, I can't remember exactly, sir. Snowbird shows me how to break the arrows as close to the skin as possible, so that we can roll him on his back, help him breathe right. I manage to get them snapped down, but it takes a while because Oswald starts to jerk around every time we touch him. We roll him over eventually, and he sucks in this painful lungful of air that hisses at us, like a viper as soon as he starts to draw his breath. I'm looking back and forth from Oswald to Snowbird, silently begging for some sort of instruction or consolation. Snowbird is returning the same look to me. His respectable brow has... unusually slack. Keeps my gaze and I see something. Something on his face. It's this sort of fluid glimmer that's just in the corner of his eye. I can hear a language that I do not understand from a voice that I do not recognize, coming from just over the ridge. Snowbird's lips are chapped and cut up. He's holding his limp arm tight to his side. His mouth sharpens into something that resembles a smile, and I can see just the tips of his teeth, like rows of ivory headstones, turned up the wrong way. The voices are getting closer now. Snowbird lets go of his sleeve and holds out a hand, where, nestled in the valleys and lines of his open palm, is the wooden owl totem that he normally has perched around his collarbones. Its round, bulbous eyes peer up at me with a vacant expression, like the face of the moon. I held his hand in mine for only a mere moment, when a tear falls and diffuses into the blood on his fingers. He relinquishes the wooden carving to my care and leaves. Snowbird climbs up and over the bank, and there are screeches, a twang, a thud, and then silence once again. I retreat to Oswald and cradle him to my chest with my back against the ridge's ivy embankment. He was starting to squirm again, making these low, breathy moans. His mouth opens and closes like a carp out of water, like he's going to scream, like we're about to be caught. 
So I have to do it, for the both of us. He would have understood. I slide my hand over his mouth and I can feel his hot breath squeeze through my fingers like church mice through rotten floorboards. His teeth are scraping against my palm as he chomps for even a morsel of fresh air and he starts to hiss again. I can feel a warm liquid start to seep through his sleeping bag and into my pad leg. He starts to jerk, starts to try to free his hands from the bag and clawed his face, but I can't let him. The past doesn't really matter in times like that, even if people would think that I had done them a favor. When he stops moving, I listen for the Cheyenne, and it's quiet. It's safe. Oswald is unconscious again at that point, but still alive. The air was cool and crisp against my cheeks when I dared to peek over the ridge and into the meadow. It was clear, no sign of anything as if the hinterlands had already forgotten. A soft orange was painting the canopy above as the sun began to set. Night would come soon, and I couldn't go back to camp. I had my guesses, but in reality I could never have known what was waiting for us back there. I had no idea the battle was won, so I decided to stay in the woods, just until morning. I heft Oswald over my shoulders and head deeper into the trees. Even trudging through nets of nettle and underbrush, I can barely feel his weight on my back. The way the last dribbles of sunlight caught the moisture on my boots was mesmerizing. Kept me in step like this metronome I used to have as a kid. My ma made me take piano lessons with this Methodist pastor at our church, and he'd take the ticker out of my hand, put it above the keys, and flick the pendulum to life. How on earth did people concentrate with something like that going? Tick, 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 tick. Careful this time. More feeling. Remember your scales. Tick, tick, tick. Listen up. You're stiff as a board. Tick, tick. All right, I'll see you next time on Friday. Remember, when you're practicing, that accuracy is more important than speed. All right? Tick. It's night. Oswald has been dead for hours, but I'm still going. The forest had already undressed for the evening when I finally stopped marching and lay his body down on a bed of moss. It's still drizzling a bit, but his blood is all dried up, making the bag stick to his open mouth. He's beautiful in a way, though, like he's in the middle of a yawn. He's not scared. He's not hurting anymore. He doesn't know the guilty night is freezing and desolate. I rub my arms together and stare down at the body, and I'm able to make out the finer features on his face in the darkness, but just barely. Leaves and dead twigs are all caught in the knots in his hair, and his crow's feet are loose against his eyes. In his sack, the way he is, he reminds me of a baby calf just loose from the womb. I knew that in the morning Oswald wouldn't be coming with me. I couldn't carry him all that way. Not that he would have wanted that anyway. He wasn't real sentimental. Most people know that. It was hard to bear just leaving him out there, though. Just thinking about the animals that could get to him and such... He didn't deserve that. I slung my gun off my shoulder and managed to hook up the shoulder strap to my belt. So, I got this thick cable that I can hook to some of the grommets in his sleeping bag. I'm looking around for a good tree, something strong and tall. It was like looking for the right grave plot or headstone. Except no one would know he was there. Eventually, there's this maple... Its branches are naked and gangly, but it has a skirt of a thousand orange and red swatches. They crunch beneath my waffle stompers, and I can smell petrichor while I look for a branch that could hold his weight. He starts to slide deeper into the sack as he gets hoisted into the tray, and I can still see the burn marks from his pipe while he dangles there like the food bags we used to hang keep away from the bears. Under his weight, the Jaeger bulges at the bottom and takes on a lumpy teardrop shape. 
like a cocoon cradling a moth never meant to fly. The pendulous mass swings lazily in the night's breeze as I sit, leaning against the trunk of that old tree. The wind hushes soggy leaves under my woolen trousers, leaving stains of brown ichor. They cling to me loosely, struggling to avoid being swept away, and the bow above me moans under Oswald's weight. I pull my arms out of my coat sleeves and cradle my chest, feeling the steady rhythm of my beating heart. The thought of a fire doesn't even cross my mind. Autumn's breath folds my eyes together tightly, and I fall asleep to the metallic clicking of the belt suspending Oswald right above me. Tick, 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 tick. I wake before daybreak. The crescent moon is still in the sky, ready to slice the horizon with its edge. I try to yawn, but the corners of my mouth are frozen together. So I'm trying to work my tongue through this little sliver I have in my lips to get them thawed when I look up at Oswald's nest, or what was left of it anyway. The bag was still tethered to the branch, just where I had left it. The belt was untouched, without a scratch. All the buckles and grommets were fine, but the bag... It had been slit by this one long slice. I would have grabbed my gun if I had any powder with me, because when a grizzly gets into a meal, it doesn't drag it. It just finishes what it's got right there. There's no bear in sight, though. No tracks, no viscera, nothing. I stand up to look at the sack and start thinking that they're might not have even been a bear that night or any other animal at all. Animals either chew their way through or make these long up and down slashes when they want to get into something. The hole in Oswald's bag is a single horizontal cut, perfectly clean and kind of bulging from the inside out. Frosted, bloody threads dangle on the outside from the freshly carved mouth, like Oswald had just crawled right out of the thing. I'm standing there, under the arms of the grey maple, staring up into the ashen thatchwork above me, looking for any explanation for Oswald's escape. A dense fog is rolling in about that time, though, and there's a growing ache in my gut. I feel like I ate a handful of shot, like I might throw up if my jaw wasn't locked shut. That's when I heard it, I swear. It's this laugh that sounds like it rides up in the nose. Makes the whistle you could hear from a mile away. Then I see him, and I do throw up. He, it, is in the mist, next to a twisted up pine, and I can make out the silhouette as the sun begins to rise through the mist. It's hunched over. I see thick fluid lurch its way from the blackened shape of the head. With a quick twitch, it pulls itself up onto its toes and bends over deeper at the shoulders, cackling a whistle the whole way. The shadow is moving now, on tiptoes, folding and unfolding in the dark of the tree trunks. It's nearly impossible to make out its direction, just that it's moving moving somewhere on stilted legs like I've never seen. When you hear someone talk about fear, they usually talk about their heart racing or tunnel vision, but they never talk about the smell, General Crook. Fear smells bitter, like the blackest coffee you can imagine. It shoots up your nostrils right into your brain and makes the base of your skull tingle smells like raw beets or clay. The things, the kind of things, you'd eat when you get the stomach bug. By then, my empty stomach wasn't aching anymore, but I still smelled that creeping, sour fear, sir. I don't move. I have to know for sure. I'm having a hard time seeing it through the fog, but I know it's watching me. It probably smells the fear, too. The forest reeked of it. It's drawing in now, close enough to where I should hear footsteps, but but I don't. 
I don't hear much of anything, noticing the unusual sounds of an old wood have died down to little more than the scraping of brittle leaves against the bark. All the forest had its gaping attention on the theater of horror. The metronome ticks in the chasm between my ears, opposite every gushing seizure of my beating heart. Time loped by slowly as the figure shifted silently closer. Closer. I see it clearly now. The leaves do not even crack underneath its boots. Then it stops. I stare into one of its milky, quivering eyes. The other hangs lazily against its dirty cheekbone, like a rotting plum. Whispering puffs of burning breath curl from its open mouth. I want to call out to him, but the knot of words is being forced so deeply in my throat that I can feel them sinking into my gut, fattening up my liver like a French goose savaged and swollen, ready to be dismembered for the sweet foie gras inside. My blood sizzles in my veins, and there is reflexive tension in my groin, in my thighs, that has turned into a spasm that nearly brings me to the ground. He lunges, and I don't move. I do nothing. For all I knew, everyone back at camp was dead, and by some cruel mistake, I'd been left behind to tally the grief to bear the weight of a thousand dead arrows. I see open hands with dagger-like claws. Nine long, jagged claws come down on me. The tenth seems to be missing like a turtle or a possum had gotten to it. I remember that, I swear. They dive into my chest and breach, followed by aching crimson ribbons. I feel the vibrations of cracking bones wriggling through my spine up to my jaw, but all I hear is that laugh. He's happy. So I don't scream. His jaws clamp down like a bear trap onto my neck. I can feel his mustache on my cheek, his heart beating through his gums, hot ichor spilling into my open wounds. Then, with the force of a grizzly, he slings me into the air, sending me sailing, disc-like, through the trees. For a brief moment, I glimpse a barn owl, its outstretched wings dimly lit by the amber glow of morning. My flight is short-lived, and I come to rest upon a bed of fractured stone, I don't have the strength or the courage to look into my assailant's face, but I hear his laughter emanating from the woods. He's coming to finish the deed, to take me with him, to drag me to hell where I belong. I should have been there for him. I should have been there. From its perch, high above, the bird gazes with its saucer-like eyes upon the chaos below. The hungry fog rolls over the slate and into the crags between each stone, swallowing everything it touches until it reaches me. I close my eyes, ready for the other side. The sound of grinding, crunching bones heralds its approach. Taut fingers wrap around my ankles and pull. Violently, I'm dragged across frozen shards of broken earth. In the distance, I can make out the moaning dirge of the owl, and with that, I drift into oblivion. I woke up, not in hell, nor in heaven, but in a dank, frigid stockade, a prison to be sure. It's still far more desirable than the confines of my regret. The men say they found me half dead on the banks of Rosebud. They say I should be grateful, sir. Grateful for a formal execution. Now, I don't know what I believe in anymore, whether in God or in chemicals. I am, however, familiar with the allegations, and I realize what many are saying. I may be a coward, sir, but I am no traitor. The truth can be found in the cold wind on the cold earth along the shattered banks of Rosebud Creek. I did not kill Oswald Crane.
and so swings the noose of justice as she brutally and blindly maintains the silence of the damned. We just hope it doesn't swing for you. After this final word, we will reveal what we have in store for you from the world of the Simply Scary Podcast. Hi everybody, this is Archibald Carlisle here. Just wanted to tell you to subscribe below so you get all the updates on what's coming up and what's coming out with the Simply Scary Podcast and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. So click that button and share us with everyone you know. Otherwise, I'll have to come looking for you. You don't want that, do you? And now, back to the show. We are excited that you have returned. I guess scary forests and hangman's nooses don't really frighten you. And you are just in time for us to reveal more details about the newest addition to our exciting weekly schedule. As mentioned earlier, the newest creation from Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, starring one of our most prized performers, Otis Jiry, premieres this Saturday, December 17th. Just a few days before Christmas and part of our Christmas gift to you. This episode was just a small taste of the terrible things to come. Each and every Saturday henceforth, Otis Jiry invites you to go walking in the dark. And while traversing the twilight trail, he shall regale you with otherworldly tales of the supernatural and the macabre, bringing to life timeless terrors bound to ruin your next outdoor excursion. Each hour-long episode will lead you off the beaten path to places you've truly never been, and which might just make you reconsider the next camping trip or late-night hike in the woods. Former host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, the extraordinarily talented Steve Taylor returns to produce this new program, and I, for one, couldn't be happier to welcome Steve back into the fold of our misbegotten family. Be sure to subscribe, if you haven't already, to the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel in order to be alerted whenever a new episode of Walking in the Dark or the Simply Scary podcast is released, or subscribe to our programs on iTunes, Stitcher, or another podcast app of your choice. If you're interested in hearing a tale of your own, performed by Otis Jari as part of his new program, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to submit your story today. Don't forget to note that this submission is for Otis's consideration. If you would like to support the Simply Scary Podcast and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and aid us in producing more spine-tingling episodes of this show, sign up on our website to become a patron today. With your membership, you will get access to our original programming in the highest quality downloads possible, plus unbelievable extras like original music, films, and much... (laughs) <laughs> Much more. Visit chillingtalesfordarknights.com forward slash tour to see what you've been missing and help us produce the type of entertainment content you know and love. Last but not least, we also have exciting news for the new year. Beginning in early 2017, the Simply Scary Podcast and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights will be launching a Kickstarter campaign in order to produce animated graphic novel adaptations of our frightening performances, as well as to fund our biggest project ever. A fully animated pilot episode of a brand new serialized horror series. Our resident artist, David Romero, who produces all of the artwork for this very program, joins us in our effort to take our diabolical form of entertainment to a whole new level.
click the subscribe button on your YouTube channel to keep up to date and get behind the scenes sneak peeks of the beginning of our Kickstarter campaign, where we'll be offering many fabulous rewards in exchange for your support. Experience a taste of what we have in mind by exploring David's incredible animated short films and experience the horror short films by David Romero playlist for yourself on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel if you think you can handle it. Of course, we recommend you do so with the lights on. And now for the final act in our cavalcade of chaos, the traditional reading of the iTunes review. It's important to keep those traditions undead, isn't it? <laughs> this episode's winner is Mr. Raven 2005. Mr. Raven 2005 writes, A more than worthy successor to Chilling Tales the podcast. Although I wish that could have continued, this show is perfectly terrifying. We appreciate your efforts in commenting to us, and we welcome all you fans transitioning from our former network show, Chilling Tales the Podcast. You can become a patron and get all the back episodes of that now-deceased show starring Steve Taylor and introducing you to producer Jesse Cornett's menacing other half. So take the tour today to find out more. Mr. Raven 2005, we need you to send a screenshot of your iTunes profile page with your review pictured to contact at simplyscarypodcast.com to claim your frighteningly fearful surprise from Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. And for those of you yet to be chosen, your number will be up soon. But only if you subscribe too and leave a review for Simply Scary on iTunes. This is G.M. Danielson, showing you the greatest of appreciation for your consumption of this episode. Remember, listeners, should you be approached in the wee hours of the night by an unfamiliar figure who offers to accompany you on your midnight stroll through the darkened forest, you best be prepared for the uncanny, because you never know just what may be walking in the dark. We will see you next time, when we prove once more that there's nothing simple about being scared. Unless, of course, it is the Simply Scary Podcast. This is executive producer Jesse Cornett. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out more from these authors at simplyscarypodcast.com. There you can find all information regarding the show and the stories appearing here in our podcast. The Simply Scary Podcast is a production of Chilling Entertainment. The showcase is written by Jesse Cornett and Dustin Kosky and produced by Jesse Cornett. The host of the Simply Scary Podcast is GM Danielson. Original music during the show by Jesse Cornett. This broadcast was directed and created by Craig Groshek. Be sure to look for the Simply Scary Podcast on iTunes. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star review. Comments or questions? Email us at contact at simplyscarypodcast.com and check our website for more information. While you're there, consider clicking on the patrons link at the top of the page to help support our show. Copyright Chilling Entertainment, LLC, 2016. Thanks for listening. Chilling tales for dark nights.